Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Welcome to our expert panel on automated data security, accelerating insights with self-service data access, brought to you by Satori. I'm Brian Meek, CEO, or President and Co-Founder of Data Science Connect, the world's largest data science community. Today, we're excited to welcome hundreds of attendees from all over the world to discuss cutting edge methods for securing sensitive data using automated data security. Organizations are increasingly seeking to democratize data, providing teams with self-service data access to enable data-driven decision-making across the enterprise. At the same time, these organizations often must maintain, must maintain stringent security and compliance standards, especially concerning sensitive PHI, PII, and financial data. Today, you'll learn how organizations are striking that balance and how automated data security can help. We're honored today to hear from a distinguished panel of experts. Mitchell Leach, Senior Director of Engineering at Strata, Yoav Cohen, CTO and co-founder at Satori, and our moderator, Nahama Katan, a Director of Innovative Data Analytics at Pfizer. We'd also like to acknowledge our partner, Satori, for making today's panel possible. Satori's data security platform enables faster use of data with self-service data access in a secure way. You'll find a call to action below to engage with them and discover just how just-in-time data access can transform your organization's data security. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. To make this feel a little more in person, we suggest you add a photo to your profile and include your bio, LinkedIn profile, and other information you want a fellow attendees to see. Also, please take advantage of the Q&A and chat features throughout the talk. We're dedicating a portion at the end to Q&A, so be sure to upvote the questions you'd like the panel to address. Now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to our expert panel. Hello, and thank you very much, Brian, for that great introduction. Um, I've spent many years of my career trying to enable self-service um, data analytics, democratizing data, et cetera, and so I'm very excited to hear more about this, this opportunity and this use case. Just quickly, uh, Mitchell and Yoa, can you do a quick introduction? We'll start with Mitchell. Keep it yeah. short. Tell us about who you are and your current role. Yeah, hi, my name is Mitchell Leach. I've been with Strata Decision Technology for a little over 15 years. My title is Senior Director of Engineering. Uh, my responsibility has been assisting our teams, our engineering teams and our data teams getting to the cloud, um, leveraging access to tools like Snowflake. Um, and I've sort of stumbled into a data governance role, um, particularly around enabling it, um, taking our policies and enabling it for our teams. And Yoav, can you give us a quick introduction? Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here. My name is Yoav Cohen. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Satori. What I do in Satori is mostly focused on product management, engineering, and customer success. So I get the benefit of uh, seeing the sausage factory, how we deliver it to our customers, and then see them implement it. And that's where I, I met Mitch uh, prior to founding Satori. I was leading the engineering teams of Imperva, a leader in application and data security. Great, so let's just jump right in. Um, Mitchell, maybe you can get start us with, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in managing data security across your organization, especially considering sensitive PHI, PII, and financial data, and so for I'm sure everyone knows what those terms mean, but with uh, changes in regulations in Europe around data security, um, I think every industry is now being impacted by sensitive identifying information around people. Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about um, the challenges we have at Strata um, and the things that we're doing to protect our protect our customers' data. So we, we are a uh, organization that works primarily with hospitals and healthcare systems. Um, we take in data from EMRs and general ledger systems. Um, so you've got financial data, financial health data of an organization, financial health data of a hospital, and then you also have patient data. Um, our biggest challenge is that our team members need to be able to see that data to be able to support our customers when we're rolling out our products. So we have tools like cost accounting, which will tell you what the cost is, cost is to care for a patient. We've got budgeting systems that look at projections and forecasts for um, the financial state of the healthcare system. So we, we 
we need to put that front and center, but we also need to enable our team members to access it to be able to really drive value for our customers. Right, and EHR for anyone from outside of healthcare is electronic health records. And we can all agree that keeping that information private is, is critical. Yoav, do you have anything to add in terms of challenges that you've seen? What are the biggest challenges you're seeing facing being faced in terms of this data security? Sure. So uh, both in my previous role, but um, primarily here at Satori and working with our, our customers, you see that uh, there's a there's a challenge with access to data requirements over access to data are constantly changing. So you can have a project and you can define what data that project or members of this project need, need access to, but then, you know, something changes and they need access to something else. So the data you prepared for that project may not be a great fit anymore and you know, serve their needs. So someone from data engineering needs to go and, you know, prepare some more data or another version of the data, that dynamic aspect of of uh, the changing changing requirements is very hard on organizations to um, to to cope with. Um, combine that with the fact that every company out there now uh, has a, 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 a just not not just one data platform that they use. They have like multiple. Uh, it's it's Strata and it's anywhere else that we work with. Um, companies don't standardize on just one thing. They have the old thing, they have the new thing, they have the cool thing, they have the what we thought is cool, but not anymore. So it's really hard for them to manage all of that slew of technologies, each with its own access control model and features, capabilities, and 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 so on. And lastly, um, this is not just a technology um, challenge. This is also an organizational challenge, like. Our company used to give everyone access to all the data. You know, now we have to be compliant. How do you, how do you go on to that on that journey without losing the trust of your users, without impacting productivity? So these are all really important and critical challenges for companies to face when they go on this uh, transition. I mean, that's that's where we're at we're we're in this transition right now we're on that journey um we just acquired another organization of similar size similar products similar solutions and you know we we're trying to figure out how we bring these two organizations together but completely different technology stacks completely different clouds like where do you even begin and you know Going on the compliance journey, you've got to find partnerships with not only the compliance team, the security team, but also on the client services side. They have to be bought in as well to be successful. Yeah, and I've seen this as well. I've worked in multiple Fortune 500 companies, and there's always the system you bought because you bought a company that had that system, and everyone who coded it is gone. And so changing security settings is let alone fixing the code is, is becomes almost impossible. I'm going to deviate from the script for a second because we've got a great question from the audience. Let's just step back a second. We're talking about security and data security and the importance of it. But I think that the business need to enable self-service data access is what drives that security need. Can either of you want to jump in and kind of explain why the critical need for self-service data access in your industries? And, and what does that allow the business to do that they couldn't do before? Uh, I'll start. Um, so we, we think about this from a couple, couple different angles, but self-service, um, the, the, we do not want to put policies and bureaucracy in the way of our team members doing their jobs. And every every time that there's an extra hoop, extra approval, it slows our teams down. Um, one of our primary use cases is to support um, any type of technical support coming through. If there's, a, if there's an issue in the system, the time that it takes for approval process to go through 
is delays and being able to answer questions for our customers. And, you know, like 10 minutes there, 10 minutes here, it's, it doesn't seem like a, a big deal, but, you know, it's also about team member satisfaction. And like, if they can get access to the data, we can document why they're accessing the data, what data they're accessing, and then auditing all their queries without them even knowing about it. There's a, there's a ton of value there, not just from the, the organization side, but from the team member side. And so it's also a, a record log of what's happened to support the next team member that may have to support that customer. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's critical because you don't want to build a frustration from client services to IT. Like the whole purpose is to enable, enable the team with technology. It's not to, to hamper it. Um, so great question, but I'll, I'll kick it over to Yoav to give his perspective. Sure, I, th I think you uh, you nailed the head. Uh, the na you hit the nail on the head on on the productivity versus security trade off. Um, what I invite the audience to to do is to think about self service access in the in a bit of a broader term, uh, not just in the focus um, sense that I as a user grant myself access in a self service way, but think about this as empowering users to pick the the right access pattern, the right access level to best suit their needs. So the way I think about this is for every piece of data out there, you can have multiple access levels like swim lanes or you know lanes in a highway. Uh, instead of deciding for users upfront what, what single lane they can pick, which translates into what policy and what capabilities they have around access to data, give them multiple um, highway lanes and let them let them pick um, and they can then take ownership on over the trade-off between security and productivity for example if i have a project and i don't have a need for access to sensitive like real sensitive data i can select um, you know give me give me this swim lane which is more secure but then i can i don't need i don't need permission i'm just gonna jump right in and, and swim I'm a swimmer, I love swimming. Uh, but if I need access to something more sensitive, I make this choice of jumping into that swim lane, but it means that I have to get approval first from my manager or the data owner and so on. So self-service for me is broader in the sense that users uh, can choose what access level they want to the data and the organization decides what hoops they need to jump through to get that access. Yeah, and, and it's not just the level of sensitivity, it's also access level, like read only. We we distinguish between read only, write, and being able to change the structure of a database. And we have those three levels. Read only for certain parts of our data, you can have access to it. It's documented. We'll see which queries you're running. But if you need to change data at the at the table level or you need to manipulate the structure of the table, let's let's go through some approval process let's put some diligence there and say hey why do you need to do this can you just go down to read and be able to be able to do your job and so um it's not just the level of sensitivity but it's also the level of access yeah there was a paper that was written i want to say about 10 years ago now that i saw where they asked it uh, business leaders quickly they wanted an answer to a question so a VP or a senior leader in an organization says, I need some business intelligence. That's the term they use then. Now they would use advanced analytics. And they asked them how oft, how quickly did they need it? And the answer was generally within 20 minutes. In my experience, it's they really want access to that ability to have that conversation while they're having the conversation. If I can open up an application and and say, hey, okay, here are our numbers. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about the other? And, and continue to cut and move data, then I can meet their needs. If we go to a traditional IT model, in most organizations that I have worked at, six weeks is what they say they can do. And in real life, it's six months. And so I see this as a key, six months is actually being nice, you off. You're looking shocked. Um, and so enabling this self-service data access is key to that because 
that's the other thing the business gets very frustrated with is don't give me fake data on what a table is going to look like. I actually need the real data and I need yesterday's data or I need today's data right now. I see we've got some more questions that have come in. Please keep posting them in the QA. We're going to I'm going to bounce back and forth between the two sets of questions. Um, so let's go back to kind of what does it take to maintain this? So, you know, how do you maintain stringent security and compliance standards without hindering the access to the data that's essential for that business person to make the decision? So maybe, Yoav, you can kind of talk a little bit about how, how Satori works in this space. Yeah, sure. Um, so accessing accessing data has some you know it has some internal risk uh, associated with it like something that is uh, is 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 unavoidance uh, we can we cannot we cannot avoid it um, if you um, only think about the risk uh, dimension then this is really not not very effective in in making a you know, a, a good trade-off, a, a good trade-off decision. Um, so you really need to um, make sure that you provide your users. It's not just a one one-sided kind of um, conversation. It's also what's the value? Why do you need this? What is this going to uh, provide an impact for for our uh, for our business? Uh, and you know some other uh, you know dimensions that you can look at with data access to data is how long do you need this data for? Right, it's very sensitive data. All right, but do you need it for an hour because you're going to fix a, a bug in production? Are we are we are our systems down? Is is business impacting? Great, uh, that's another trade off. Um, uh, what's the access level? As Mitch said, is this read only rewrite? Are you going to change the database, the structure of the database? Um, maybe, um, maybe you don't need access to all of that sensitive data. Maybe you only need like just one one piece of sensitive data. So we can help you. We can help you with uh, with that. So, um, and from a more technical perspective, what you want to focus your attention on is uh, what we call late binding controls, uh, which means. Instead of building data sets for each pr pr predicted access pattern um, and you know masking the data statically on the database, hey, there's one table without sensitive data. Here is the same table with just half of the sensitive data. Here is the original table. Uh, focus on controls that act uh, when people access the data, like dynamic masking, for example, where you can make that decision on access time. Um, so I think that's uh, that's how you manage that trade-off between security, compliance, and the utility of the data. Uh, you have to make sure that you look at multiple dimensions and you focus on um, a system that can provide dynamic controls instead of static controls. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I love the idea of getting access to data for an hour. That's right. Mitchell, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I mean, all, what this boils down to is like automation. Um, you can't you can't be successful unless you're automating everything, and that's got to be the end goal. And if you come up short, document those pieces and make them as painless as possible for all the stakeholders. But if you're not going into this with a, a mindset of automating absolutely everything you're not going to be successful. There's going to be too much human variable in there and you're going to generate frustration. So access to the data, self-service, that's, I mean, that's the spirit of this, but it's also, are you documenting that out of the box? Are you getting that automatically? Are you generate? are you identifying new data stores automatically? Um, and including them in the the security set. So it's just it's automation is king and it's going to be it's going to be whether you fail or succeed at at being in compliance. Yeah, that reminds me, right? What do we all learn in our security classes is that what's the weakest link in your system is a human. 
um, typically. And so having automated rules mean that you've got compliance and ways of documenting those automated. Very cool. All right, for our next question, we're going to talk about some best use cases that you've seen or deployed in your organization, leveraging automated data security. I know everyone on this call is like, okay, in theory, it sounds like a great idea, but what does it really look like in, in real life? And what were your kind of favorite uh, use cases? Mitchell, I'll let you start there and then go up. Yeah, I mean, we've done this two different ways, but it, it, the end result is is the same. So we support our customers through using Salesforce um, and coming back to the, the support model. Um, what we've done is we've tied access to particular client databases around the creation of a Salesforce ticket, the assignment to a team member. When that team member joins that Salesforce ticket, they get access to that client. As long as that Salesforce ticket is open, they have access. Once that ticket is closed, their access is revoked. And so the whole automation, like a, a technical support person on our team, they don't have to go ask for anything. It's we are ahead of them by saying they have access now. And you know, that's the rationale, that's the documentation piece of like saying, why did you access this client's database? All right, there's a Salesforce case. We've we've tied it to the security and compliance to our natural workflows in our business. And it's I mean, it, that's going to be where you don't even know that there is a compliance and governance and security part of the organization. It's just natural to the business. And so you got to find those workflows where you have a reason to have a team member in the data and automate around that. I love that idea. I was just going to take a note in my organization to assign access automatically when you get a new a new study or something to work on. Um, Yo, know, do you have a particular use case? Yeah, um, being a veteran engineering leader and always working on on SaaS products, I know how stressful it can be to handle production issues as a as an engineer. So one of my favorite um, self service just in time access uh, use cases is for engineers who need to access databases in production. So it can be, um, you know, just we need to debug something, you know, low stress, there's some customer ticket going on. I need to look into the database, understand what's going on. That can be like a self-service. I either, you know, either go into my Satori CLI and request access or go to the Satori data portal and request access. And then self-service, I, I, I get access and, uh, um, that's that's really easy for me to. It even improves my experience uh, because I have all my databases. They sit in one place. I click a button. I get the access. Uh, for anyone who works in engineering in production, knows that environments are very complex, and not necessarily you have everything in in a single place where you can like a gateway, like a portal where it's all organized for you. But then if I need to, hey, there's some bad character here in one of the fields that's causing our web app to crash, I really need to remove that, that thing that I can go in and, and get that elevated access right away. Maybe I'm the on-call engineer and you know I can do it without approval even, uh, and then fix the problem and then go back out. And all of what I did is completely audited. All of my queries are attributed to the reason I provided when re requesting the access, which is perfect for compliance. Um, so I think it's, the best use cases are when the security system is actually an enabler for productivity and not slowing down productivity. 100%. That's uh, that's where that's a sweet spot where magic happens, in my opinion. Yeah, yo, I'll go a step further. If you, if you're within your your normal development lifecycle, you've got your Jira tickets or your Azure DevOps tickets. If you have the proper tagging around the information, it's this client. It's associated with this data when that ticket gets moved into development your access is granted you don't even need to ask for it it's just there and then you you've you've eliminated even the requesting component of it and then you have so the true. full traceability of what happened which is so key in these 
yep. environments is not enough to control the data. You have to say who accessed it, when, and why. Yep. Answer those questions. In my industry, years later, very, very exciting. Um, let me ask another question from the Q and A because I think this is a an interesting question. So um, Chelsea is. If the risks or gaps aren't apparent within the current governance system, does Satori help with the risk analysis to build the formative use case? So before you jump to answer that, Yara, I think that um, for many of us on this call, the value of this tool is huge, but then it becomes a question of, all right, how do I either sell it to my management as something that we need to bring in, or how do I set it up when it comes in? Because it sounds like there's a lot of knowledge around you attach it to tickets, you attach it to Salesforce. Like, how do you do that risk assessment, which really is the beginning of all, all security type systems? So you want to talk about the support you guys offer with that? Sure, definitely. Um, so we, we see many companies that come come to this from um, a risk perspective. We see many companies who come to this from a productivity perspective, like the engineering teams or the analytics teams. They want this tool because they think it's going to make their lives easier, which is huge. If you come to this problem from the risk perspective, uh, what Satori and you know, similar tools can provide is an understanding of how complex and risky your data environment uh, really is. Um, so what we in Satori built a while ago is a tool called Poster Manager. And Poster Manager um, scans your databases and provides you with an analysis of all of the users we see, all of the data assets we see in the databases. Uh, when we share how many we see uh, and what type of data we see in there, but we also highlight how users get access to these data assets. Now, in some, some, in some cases, that's really complex. And you know, complexity translates into risk. So we can come into an organization, they may have Snowflake for, for, for an example, as an example, and we can list all of the users, all of the roles, all of the data assets, and we can, we can provide them with an analysis of how users get access to these data assets via these complex, uh, chains of role inheritance. And what we often see in real life environments, we see that Yoav gets access to the customer's table by 10 different permission paths. That's how we call them. So it's so complex yeah, in, some, in some of these environments. Um, and you, ha you can actually do it yourself. We have an open source tool out there. Uh, it's called the Universal Data Permissions Scanner. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can run it yourself um, or you can, you know, contact us and we'll help you with that. But that's, that would be a first step, understanding the complexity of the environment. And if you go to your, uh, your manager, if you go to your data platform owner and you say, oh, we have 1,500 users, 50,000 data assets, and about 40 million ways where these users get access to this data, and we were completely lost, I think that's a good start. Yeah, I love open source tools. Mitchell, you had something to add to this? Yeah, I, I I think about it. You were you broke it down into is it a a you're coming at the problem from a risk standpoint or from a productivity standpoint? And like if you are coming at it from a risk standpoint, it's a top down approach to the organization. It's got to come from your executive leadership that this is important. It's not going to grow organically out of the team members. The traction there is going to be really challenging, but. If it's a developer productivity or a team member productivity, I think that can grow more organically from the bottom up where you can rationalize that to leadership. Um, so it depends on which angle you're coming at it. Um, but you you need to understand where your problems are. Tools like Satori can help you get there. Um, but you know, just I would think about it from the domains that you're serving and the people that have access to those domains as your starting point. You can you can figure out which sector of the market you're in, which compliance you have to be in line with, um, and use that to help you do your risk analysis. Let me just add a quick thing. You know, first of all, can you put in the question, the QA tab, 
um, the name of the tool on GitHub. Not everyone ca caught it. Sure. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that if you think about it from a listening to you, I think that there's actually a third dimension. But first, productivity is getting access quickly. Risk is getting having your access removed quickly. I don't know how many of you guys have worked in organizations that will remain nameless, but you got access to a piece of data, you changed your job, and getting that access revoked was never done, let alone dynamically um, against the ticket. So then people get access to too much. Um, so that's it. But I'm going to add that there's a third uh, reason to have this um, security, and that's the uh, business value. So there's a question here around how does self-service data access contribute to agility and responsiveness in this data-driven decision-making culture, right? We need to make decisions quickly. The world is changing. I mean, it was changing all the time before COVID, but between COVID and everything else going on in the world, every every six months, at least in my organization, there's another crisis to respond to because that's impacting our data. So, um, and from a business value, how do you see data security being really key to allowing the senior executives or management or even the people on the ground to um, go in and, and and have that data-driven decision making, which is the purpose of having access to your data? I would start by, you know. As you're going on this journey, it is a conversation starter with the business because they may not know what is even possible. You may data and you have to you have to go and create all of these different like conversations, emails, Slack channels just to even get started. I think as you are going towards that that end goal, right? Of, creating access to your data, you can think about what are opportunities that may be, may be less self-service, but more guided on how you get access to data so that like people know where to start. Um, if you're not talking about it, you know, either people are doing it behind the scenes or they just don't have access and don't know where to begin. And so I think as you start the journey, you need to think about what, Beyond like, obviously, security, compliance, all that stuff is basic and needs to be satisfied. But like, what are you enabling also as you're doing this? Like creating a pathway for access can also mean getting more people access to the data in a controlled way. Yeah, one of our, <clears throat> one of our uh, customers uh, they have this saying, you have to make the, the secure way the easy way. If you make the secure way the easy way, people are just going to do what's, what's easy, right? They're not, they're not here to complicate their lives. Uh, definitely, this is what uh, Mitch and the team is, is, doing, uh, is doing at Strata. I would uh, echo that 100%. Yeah. It, yeah. If something's hard, you're not going to get any adoption. Like if, if it's frustrating... If it's extra clicks, if you have to go to an entirely different portal to get access to something and then go somewhere else and then go somewhere else, like it's got to be easy and in line with somebody's day to day. Um, and really, that's that's where you're going to get adoption. That's where you're going to get buy in. And our our I've seen it. It's not about just security and compliance. It's in everything. It's can you make documentation easier? Can you make access to certain things easier? It's like, if you want, if you want adoption of anything, it's got to be easy for your team. Yep, I have to solve that last mile problem because otherwise, what people are going to do is either they open up their data systems to everyone, and they never close it, and that's a risk, or they open it to no one, and then you can't do any of that data decision, data driven decision making because you're stuck in that six month IT loop. Um, until you'd have access. So now very that's, that's amazing, Nahama. That's exactly what they call it. The same organization they call it Satori, you help us solve the last mile problem. That's exactly yeah, it's a last say. mile problem because what happens in I'll get my little plug for this one, right? So most people build business systems like this. This is the new process, this is the old process, this is the new process. But when you do this, 
Then your project descopes, you create friction, create a dead zone, a demilitarized zone, a last mile pond, whatever you want to call it. And so now you've created this brilliant little technology solution here, but the rest of your business process is all the way over here and nobody can get across that gap, that moat, which isn't the purpose of project. And so, yeah, anything that you can fix these types of automated ways to fix these types of problems, not doesn't just give you the productivity, but it also gives you the, the traceability. So, and which also raises the interesting business dynamic where people are like, well, I can go quickly or I can go safely. The answer is no, actually going safely quickly is possible. It's not always a trade-off between safety, speed, and quality and security. It, it, it can be done or value, right? You can actually do all three if you solve problems in different ways. So let's, um, Good. We've got some more time. Please keep adding questions because I, I love the questions from the um, audience. They're, they're fun to put in. Um, we posted the GitHub link in both the chat and the Q&A, so it's posted now in both places. But what key piece of advice, Mitchell and Yoav, would you offer to organizations who are thinking about automating their data security and access work? So we just kind of talked about why doing it isn't going to be a burden. But, you know, it's still daunting to imagine what would it mean to go from a fixed data security model with a ticket system to something like this. So what, what's kind of that first piece of advice getting started? I mean, I talked about this a lot. I, I think you have to have the intention to automate every step of the way and things that you can't automate you you have to i love the word friction in this is like you have to reduce the friction as much as possible so adoption is easier um you know finding partners across the business it's not just in the it and security team to actually lay stuff out it's the team members that are going to be affected by this and you you go to them uh with a bit of humility and you you understand their workflow and my goal was what how do you access data when do you access data when do you need access understanding the scope of of their job and and meeting them with automation it, it comes back to automation because like you know like the project's going to be so much harder if you have to have people buying into a, a laborious process and you know, understanding that team members are accessing client databases. Okay, well, in which context? Why do you go into a client's database? When, what's the reason? What's the, what do you need to do to get that access? And, you know, meet them where they're at um, is really the only way to do it. You you can have that executive push down, but, nah, that doesn't you know, it, yeah, you, you, you know, like you can rationalize, like we're doing this because we want to protect our customers' data. Great. How does that negatively impact my day to day? If you can go and say it doesn't, that that's easy, right? But if you're saying you have to go through all these extra steps and like you need to write, you need to attach the Salesforce ticket to your access request and do all this stuff, then it becomes pretty painful. But automation, cool. take it in steps. Find your local leaders to work with um, and like go with humility and like seek to understand where they're, what their what pathways are, what they care about, what their challenges are. And, and, you know, like automate away their pain. You, you can make it better for them too in the process. Yeah. Let me just double click on that for a second. The, the automation. Um, a lot of very large organizations have been going through a um, robotic automation. We automate this, we automate that. And the IT departments will come and say, well, write your user, your use case, write your requirements, right? And then they write the requirements and you realize that really the way you automated it wasn't aligned with the best practices for the tool. 
So then now the automation either doesn't work or the tool doesn't work or something doesn't work, right? So when you're talking about meeting them with humility, are you talking about sitting and watching them do their work? Are you talking about asking them to make videos of their work? Are you talking about asking them to fill out a requirements document? It, it's definitely not asking them to fill out a requirements document. That may be a support piece, but you know, hat in hand, go stand on their doorstep and say, can I spend time with you? Can I ask you questions? Can I look at, can I log into Salesforce with you and understand your workflow? I mean, we would have missed so many requirements if we didn't spend that time. Yep. And, and, you know, you're going to miss requirements and, you know, lead with apology and lead with gratitude and, and bake that in. It's not, you're not done after the first pass. Um, you know, I, I partnered with some very great people at our organization that are supporting our customers every single day, 10, 15 customers a day. And like, you can't, you can't op outsource that to an engineering manager. You can't outsource that to an IT person. You've got to be with them. Um, and I, I would say like, it's a partnership. And if you don't have partnership, you're not going to be successful. Yep. Okay. You have anything to add there in terms of key pieces of advice? Yeah, I think that um, empathy is key here. And uh, I'll give you an example from today. We have uh, we have two new employees joined today, uh, one one in our office here. So I scheduled a meeting with that employee today because we're also using Settle internally. And I just wanted to see what the first time user experience looks like. Uh, so uh, we just sat and we we you know click the buttons and you know that person got into the system you know everything was fine i was happy but <laughs> it's you know you have to go and meet them where they are um understand that every every small you know think about it, the way we work with tools right uh, you download a, an app to your phone like if if it doesn't click for you in, in like 2 seconds you you're off to the to the to the to another app so um obviously in the workplace it's it's harder but it doesn't translate into that user going doing other things it translates into that's going to be harder for him uh, it's going to be harder for that person to be data driven because it's all about data which is going to um it's going to slow down our entire company and you know reduce our our overall data decision uh, uh decision making capabilities yep. so yeah meet them at they are go go spend time with them yeah, IT and tech people were nice. We really are nice. I'm scrolling through the look at the um, questions here. There was a great question, but they keep remapping it by order. So to be able yeah. to see it. Okay, so the question was around, and it's kind of um, a similar here. It's so great. I'm sold on it. Mitchell's been using this forever. Yoav loves it because he developed it. But you know, what are the biggest objections you're hearing um, around automating data security from senior leadership, decision makers, and how do you overcome them? Um, I can, what's I what's can, your favorite can... objection that you're like, I've got the answer to that? And then what's your <laughs> objection? You were like, oh, okay, let me scratch my head. Um, so I would say we see two types of companies. Uh, you know, archetype, archetypes of companies. You see there's more smaller, smaller side uh, organizations where access to data, even sensitive data is like free for all. Um, and there you get the objection where like, well, we got access to everything in all the databases. Now you come in and say, we have to like do something about this and we're, we're limited in, 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 in a sense. That's, uh, that's that's a big uh, that's a big uh, objection. Uh, on on the other spectrum, you have these larger organizations where they keep everything, you know, more locked down, and then it's uh, like they're not moving it with data at all. It's super 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 slow. Um, so I think the biggest objection is I used to have access to everything, and now you are maybe going to slow slow us down um oftentimes 
Um, it's the other way around, and we make believers out of them. We actually show them that you know, the secure way can be the easy way. But you know, at, at, at the uh, beginning of the process, uh, these these things come up. You know, we didn't have much objection, but I think that you have to do your homework and you have to preempt some of the, the concerns around it. You know, the I had access to everything. How are you going to make my life harder? Like again, leading with empathy. Like we're not making your life harder. We're just asking you to adopt this this policy and maybe you don't even have to change your workflow. Like the extent of Satori, you have to change your connection string. And if you can even automate a component of that away, then you can you can you can get it without much objection. I mean, you can't just be like, all right, we're gonna implement this policy and it's gonna mean this. I think you need a plan to circumvent it. But you know, when we were talking to our team members, they all got it. They all understood the implications because, you know, we support a lot of healthcare and my data is in this data set. So like if you're concerned at all about, you know, your sensitive healthcare information, your um PII going out the door, like it it can resonate and you can you can make it easy to see. I know not all, not all use cases are the same, but like if you, you can preempt a lot of the concerns by understanding the problems that they go through and what automated data security would, would, would change about their, their day to day. Um, I was just, I went over to the chat because there were some questions there instead of in the Q and A. And you have answered the one about how do you um, try it? There's a tricitoy now meeting. So that's that's the first question. But the second question is, I think one that is near and dear to everyone who's tried to hard who's tried to bring something new into an organization, which is integration into other tools. So can you guys talk a little bit about how this integrated into how this integrates into other systems? What's that integration look like? Um, how much friction is in there? And um... I can start. Um, so one of the can challenges. I throw it? Let me give another. Example. Let me just add a little more color. Can I throw it on top of Databricks, or is this going to become a huge problem? I've got, you know, or can I? Like, I hear about Salesforce, but there's plenty of other CRM tools, PRMs, etc. Or EHR systems, can I throw it on top of Epic if I'm in the healthcare system? So sorry, you are interrupted. Yeah, for sure. Uh, no problem. I think that one of the principles that we designed Satori around is that principle of universality. Um, we would like as much as we can to make Satori um, effective on as many systems as as possible and we believe that's very important because that's what the market needs because you have snowflake today you may you may have had something else yesterday and it's still around or you're going to use something else tomorrow and if you've been around the data space in the in the last decade there are so many data systems like 10 years ago i was building my own data systems like from scratch and now we have these all these great uh, cloud-based tools, so it's uh, super dynamic. So um, I think the we try to not limit ourselves to just one type of in integration. We we have developed really great technology, one type of technology that can integrate with many many types of uh, systems, but. Um, for uh, other types of systems, we use other type of types of technologies. But um, like I tell my team, it's it may be a different plumbing, uh, you know, under the hood, but it's the same product. It's like whether you get your TV by satellite or internet, it doesn't matter. You have a remote, you click a button, you watch a movie. So it's the same experience, uh, but uh, we try to translate that experience into as many different platforms as we can. So you mentioned Databricks uh, is one platform that 
they now have a, an, an internal, let's call it a data governance engine uh, called Unity Catalog. So we integrate directly with Unity Catalog um, to implement all of the uh, Satori capabilities. Uh, could be a Postgres database. So we integrate with that a bit, a bit differently. Um, so I think the, the potential for integrating is, uh, for integration is, is, is quite high. And uh, that's something that Satori and I, I would also advise other companies in that field to, um, to put an, an emphasis on. And you know, on top of that, you want to have a lot of tooling. You want to have APIs, you want to have Terraform, you want to have built-in integrations uh, with identity providers, which play a critical role in the management of access to data because that's where your user information lives, right? So you want to have your Okta integration, your Azure AD integration, your Google Workspace integration, and you know there are a slew of other systems that you want to integrate with. All right, and I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that if there's some type of integration you haven't thought of, you have, that you guys would be willing to help people sort that out. For sure, for sure, we uh, we are very. All of our roadmap is like things that customers asked us to do. Uh, which I think is great because uh, I know for me, product management is easy. I just need to listen to my great customers and what they need. You know, Mitch knows it. Uh, they eventually get, uh, hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. So definitely, we're very um, we're very focused on what the, what we hear the market needs, and we'll never go and invest a lot of time in building something that is completely out there. Um, Right, so um, we have a couple minutes left. I know this goes until one o'clock, but if we can do a quick lightning around one minute each, um, kind of what is the critical insights or takeaways about the future of automated data security and self-service? Then we can let these guys have five minutes to go get their coffee before their next meeting. So Mitchell, do you want to go first? I, I'm a broken record, but it's, it's automation, and understanding who's accessing the data. It, it's as simple as that. If you do not have those two things, security is going to be hard, it's going to be cumbersome, and you're going to have a lot of very frustrated team members. All right, Yoab, you have one moment of... Reflection. Um, so I would say, you all, it's easier than you think. Uh, people tend to go into these data security projects, uh, you know, with a lot of uh, hesitation. They think it's a waterfall type of thing. I first need to map all my data. I then need to classify all my data. And then I need to go and ask all my users how they're accessing the data and so on. And we, we, we just take a different approach. We think you can do it in phases. You can... Uh, pick your 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 uh, most important flows and deploy it to there. We have ways to do it in a very transparent way that doesn't impact your existing operations, and so on. Um, so, you know, my piece of advice is making the secure way the easier is is way easier than you think. So, uh, give it a try. Yeah, I iteration, hundred percent. I'm with you there. We we are we're still iterating. We're still adopting. It's a journey. It's not all at once. So yeah. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. And, and I'm new to, to, to have just met you guys. And um, you know, the message I've gotten is you can have dynamic access without paying for it in productivity. And then if you partner with a company like Satori, you're going to be able to have that continuous improvement and support. So I'm going to make a plug here for you guys. There's a Book a meeting with Satori button on the bottom of this workshop. They can go to satori.com, I'm assuming, as well, Yoav, and yep. um, or just reach out to Yoav on email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nehama. Thanks, Mitch, uh, for taking Thank the you. time. Much appreciated. Of course. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thanks to Mitchell, Yoav, and Nahama for the excellent insights on automated data security and accelerating innovation. If you missed any of this webinar or want to rewatch anything, the recording will be available right after the webinar if you refresh the page. And as Nahama mentioned, uh, you can book a meeting with Satori using the link below. Thanks again for joining us.